But welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today on this session on how to avoid polarization when reporting on hot button issues. It's an important topic all the time, but has heightened importance during the election season. So we're grateful that you all made time to join us today. Um, this is just one of five different training sessions that Trusty News is hosting um, around how journalists can earn trust with their audience with their election coverage. Um, so if you guys just um, registered for this one or just started tuning in, you have now access to our next training in a couple of weeks, which we'll talk about at the end of the session, and also have access to the recordings of our previous trainings as well. Um, but we're glad to have you here with us today. For those who don't know, uh, Trusty News is an organization that since 2016, we've been working to learn how people decide what news to trust. Um, and then we've been empowering journalists with those learnings and those strategies so that they can earn trust with their own audiences. I'm Molly Muchna. I am the project manager with Trusty News, and I'm joined today by my colleague, who is our executive director and um, founder, Joy Mayer. And also we have a really special guest today. We're really excited to have investigative reporter Don Diedrich here with us today from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Um, John has been an investigative reporter for many, many years, so has a lot of experience covering challenging and controversial topics. Um, and he kind of first came on our radar at Trusty News a year or two ago, and he did a really fantastic series on reporting about guns and gun deaths across the state of Wisconsin. Um, and a lot of the approach that he took to that was a lot of the strategies and recommendations that we emulate at Trusty News. So we're really excited to have John here with us today. Um, if you've been to any of these other training sessions in this series, you'll notice that today is a slightly different format. Um, Joy and I will spend a few minutes laying the groundwork for the conversation up top. Um, but a lot of today will be spent doing a live Q&A with John. Um, so we'll ask John some questions, but also um, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions as well. And we'll make sure to leave time for audience questions. So um, throughout this um, training, please feel free to um, say hi in the chat or interact or drop questions. We'll be moderating that throughout um, for John or for us, um, or you can save them at the end and, and ask them as well. So covering controversial and hot button issues is really, really tricky uh, because oftentimes these subjects um, and topics are really emotionally charged for our communities, right? Which means that it's almost guaranteed that some people will either um, disagree with or get upset or blow off your coverage altogether, whether it's they see a headline that they don't like, um, maybe just the topic in general they don't like, and they see that you covered something and they automatically um, tune out or automatically think that you're biased and skip it altogether. Um, in addition to this kind of uh, perceived political agenda that people feel like journalists sometimes have when covering these controversial topics, people also really feel like the news contributes to polarization. We have lots of insights from partner newsrooms and research that shows this, uh, but people feel like journalists are... Um, whether it's for clicks or for views, or again, to push a political agenda, people feel like journalists are um, contributing to the division in the country. And what is something that we wanna address today and part of what we're addressing with this topic is that unfortunately too often, whether unintentional or intentional, the news often does um, feel polarizing, right? It does overgeneralize groups of people and label groups of people it, and really reinforces this idea that people are split into these separate um, political camps. So we have lots of research and again, lots of insights from partner newsrooms that highlight this, but just one that I'll share quickly today is from this group, More in Common. And they did this research study called The Perception Gap. And a, a really interesting finding from this was that they saw that the more news that somebody consumed, um, the more skewed their view of somebody across the political aisle was. So if you were a Republican, um, they said if you consumed more news, the more skewed your view of Democrats and what they thought was. And so um, while this was um, causation, or sorry, correlation, not causation, um, it is interesting and just worth thinking about because as journalists, of course, our impact and our ability to carry out our um, public service mission is really limited if we're seen as part of the polarized society, if we're seen as part of this problem. So our focus here at Trusty News is always, we wanna tie big theoretical concepts to strategies that you can put into practice right away. So um, the question we're always asking is, if you are a mission-driven, mission responsible, ethical journalist, what in the world can you do in light of all this information? 
So um, we want to talk today about what it looks like to cover hot button issues, polarizing issues, complicated issues in a way that is hearable by people who view those issues through really diverse lenses. Um, some journalism is done through a specific lens and your focus is on centering those voices and highlighting an issue, covering an issue through a specific lens. That's perfectly fine with us. We're not suggesting that the, as long as you're transparent about that, about where you're coming from and what your values are and what your ethics are um, and your mission, then um, that's absolutely fine. We're not here at Trusting News to say everybody needs to be um, hearable and needs to serve everybody. But if you are here because you're, one of your goals is to um, serve a complex uh, community with a lot of different views and issues, then we hope today is useful to you. So today we want to talk about what it looks like to share information on complicated polarizing topics that people across a range of views can hear, whether or not like there aren't obstacles to them being able to consume it and understand it. We want people to see themselves in your journalism as you, as journalists, try to tell the story about a complex landscape. Um, we want people to feel like you understand where they are coming from to, um, even as you go deep with different stakeholder groups to in the body of work that is your coverage, see that they, their values and views and questions and fears are reflected. And then to be able to use, um, use your information to have conversations, make decisions. Hopefully journalism equips people to participate in public life and to deliberate, to make shared decisions, right? That's democracy. So that does not mean that um, journalists need to reflect every view, that they need to always quote people from every side of a story, every side. Um, it does not mean that we need to soften facts or make them more palatable to people who don't agree with facts. It doesn't mean we need to give credence to conspiracy theories. It, what we're talking about is understanding enough about how a range of people see a view to meet them where they are, to um, use language and framing that um, encourages people to keep an open mind and that builds empathy and curiosity across differences. Um, we wanna do a better job of wading through an issue's complexity and not oversimplifying them. And again, just making them hearable. So one tool that we've used that if you've come to these webinars, you've heard us talking about, and we're not gonna talk more about it today, but we just wanted to mention that one of the things we've developed at Trusting News is an, along with Partner Newsroom was an anti-polarization checklist that walks reporters and editors through some just questions to ask about um, the way you're framing your stories, the questions you're asking, how you're sourcing, the way you're writing headlines, whose language you're adopting. Um, and it's really been uh, helpful to newsrooms just to kind of take a pause and make sure that their own assumptions and values and um, that their decision-making takes into account how the story is likely to land. So just one of the ways that we want to um, touch on before we get into the Q&A with John today of, of kind of how you can work to make your coverage feel less polarizing is by complicating the narrative. And this is a concept that was coined by the Solutions Journalism Network that essentially means um, journalists seeking out different perspectives and framing and sources that um, do exactly that, that complicate the narrative, that um, reach beyond kind of these easy stereotypes that we often have or reach beyond these buckets that we so often can put people into um, and that have more complex and nuanced views. So they have this really great um, PDF handout that we can share a link to in the chat that has 22 questions you can ask during an interview that help you complicate the narrative. Um, some of them are like, what do you think is oversimplified about the issue? Um, where do you maybe feel torn? Is there any part of the other side's position that makes sense to you? Um, and as you start to complicate the narrative, I think something that you'll see more and more of is that people are much more similar than news and even politicians often um, portray. This is a screenshot of one of our newsroom partners, Arnesa Garrett who participated in a research project a couple years back with us around polarization and generalizations. And um, she was sharing in this video just some reflections and insights. That's one of the biggest takeaways that she had from this project about polarization was that on um, really polarizing topics, people are not so far from each other, right? Um, she was saying what she heard was people weren't all for banning immigration and building a wall or not all open border and letting everyone in. Instead, a lot of people were had much more complex views than that, of course. Um, and that people felt frustrated who were being painted as anti-immigration, who really were just saying that they wanted a more orderly system, right? 
Um, so there's a lot of danger as journalists when we kind of slap these labels on to different groups of people and, and overgeneralize. Um, we miss some of that nuance and complexity. Um, and so that's something that's really important to think about um, and keep in mind as you are sourcing stories is like thinking about how can your sources maybe be unpredictable? How can they add to this complexity and nuance? Um, and this is just an example from this organization starts with us that um, uh, featured someone like this. They are an organization working to solve um, political division in the United States. And they have uh, basically a blog post that's an interview with this um, gentleman, Benji Backer, who identifies as both a conservative and an environmentalist. And this whole post is him kind of talking about how he feels so often um, that this top, that he doesn't fit into a bucket, right? And it's not neat and how it's actually really disarming to people when he meets Democrats and he tells them that he has this complex views and it allows for more open conversation. So um, imagine how fruitful our stories could be if we had more sources like Benji in them. One thing to be um, wary of as well as you're working to both complicate the narrative and avoid polarization in your coverage is to not let catchy headlines or colorful language get in the way. Um, we've done, again, some research projects around polarization and some research specifically around headlines. And what we heard from news consumers was that sometimes the story was really well reported. Maybe the story was fair and had a lot of these nuanced perspectives and views throughout um, and people felt like it was a, a well-reported story, right? Um, but then there was like a really inflammatory headline on it or some language throughout it that, or specific words or labels for groups of people that felt really emotionally charged and felt like it signaled that a journalist was coming from one viewpoint or the other. Um, what news consumers said that they would actually prefer was to have words and headlines that feel a bit more neutral and even more um, quote unquote sterile. And the screenshot is just, um, a look at how NPR is thinking about this. This is a screenshot from their standards editor, Kelly McBride. And essentially they are talking about their language and how they label and talk about people's beliefs around abortion. And um, she gets at exactly this saying like, you know, the idea behind the guidance that they have at NPR is to really scrub the emotional and political arguments from the language and instead point to the specific issues and the policies. Another example of this um, that you've probably seen if you've come to any of these other election trainings is from the Tangle newsletter, which is a daily nonpartisan newsletter that deep dives into one topic. And their founder, Isaac Soul, um, is really great about getting transparent um, about their internal decisions in the newsroom. And um, this is a screenshot of their ethics policy talking about specifically um, immigration and what terms they've used to talk about um, immigration. And they were saying that they felt like either using the term illegal alien or undocumented migrant signaled to one side or the other where the newsroom was coming from or what the journalist's beliefs were. And so they opted for this kind of third term, unauthorized migrant, which is a legal term, um, because they felt like that scrubbed the most emotional and political arguments from it. So they were able to do the most effective reporting, make sure their reporting was hearable from people on both sides by using this term. Um, at Trusting News, again, we're not specifically recommending what language you should or shouldn't use, um, but just being thoughtful about that and, and being mindful of how the language that we use might um, come across to people in our audience. Um, it's really best to be sp as specific as possible, describing policy if you can, um, and then be consistent with that. And if possible, talk about it publicly with your audience. The Tangle newsletter is one we point to a lot because it was founded on a principle that they want to be um, accurate and relatable and useful to people across the political spectrum. And so they have studied a lot about language use. Their founder, Isaac Saul, has a great TED talk on this topic in case you are interested. So the question of um, reporter humility is one we talk about a lot, journalist humility. What does it look like to be really curious about how your coverage is landing? Um, and what would it look like to include as part of your interviews as standard practice, asking the question, what are you afraid I might get wrong? It, it, does, it does a lot of things. I think it accomplishes a lot of things. It acknowledges that journalists get things wrong, not just you, but like in general, if people are invested in a topic, if they're paying attention to news on a topic, if they have been covered before, if people if, they, if something they care about deeply is in the news regularly, they probably have a good list going of what journalists do get wrong. And it helps us. It does not undermine our credibility. It adds to it if we're willing to acknowledge that. I think the question of, um, you know, we're not here to sort of defend and explain all of journalism. There are a lot of things done in the name of journalism that are not 
responsible that are not um, things that I would be proud to put my name on or be affiliated with. So as we are interacting with people out in the world, the more we can do to, to ground our work in an understanding of how what journalism gets right and wrong about things that are covered a lot, um, the better. So it actually works with local interviews too. It, it works if you're interviewing a new business owner about traffic patterns changing. Um, what are you afraid I might miss? What are you afraid I might get wrong at the beginning rather than that tack on question at the end that also has use, which is what else do you wish I'd asked? If you ground the conversation and the perspective, like I know that journalists might be getting things wrong about this. Um, what would you like me to know? I think um, can be really, really useful. And keeping that spirit alive throughout your coverage can really help um, send a message that you would like to be responsive to audience perceptions and needs. This is one example, just screenshots from um, Instagram conversations. Annalise Pierce um, at the Shasta Scout um, used a term in a story. She um, was using the term far Christian right. And she was getting questions from people, I believe, about whether that was um, like what that meant. The question said, what do you mean by far Christian right? And she posed the question and invited Instagram followers to chime in and got a little, a lot of really interesting questions. And it raises both specific questions about who gets to decide what is far right. Um, are we modifying that or qualifying that in any way, any of the words far Christian or right in that statement. But then also, do we defer to people about how they wanna be um, identified? Are we the ones deciding whether that label applies to people? And then her last, um, the last screen grab here, Annalise writes, the variety of responses are important because they indicate how differently my words in an article can be interpreted depending on people's existing frameworks, which is why using this term, which seems to provoke strong and subjective meanings for the reader was most likely the wrong editorial decision. So again, our goal is not here to say, these are the political labels that are appropriate to use and these are not. Um, another, another piece she wrote, someone was identifying as a constitutional conservative, which people were saying, gosh, that's a euphemism. So just in general, our goal is for journalists to think more carefully about the language they're using, to be aware of how language might feel to people, um, and not to try to make everybody happy, <laughs> um, but to be humble enough to realize when your language choices might not be the same ones your, your community would use, and um, transparent enough to explain your choices. And then a question that we ask a lot is how, um, how the experiences and perspectives of people on staff are or are not reflected in the audience and what we might be missing based on how, how the gaps that might be on our own staff. So if you, you know, this happens all the time in newsrooms that we'll cover things like if, you know, in my last newsroom, people were, would come to me and ask questions about things happening in the schools. Cause I was one of the only editors at the time with young kids in schools. Right. So we, or I'm going to ask this person about like fishing because if I'm covering fishing, because I know that this colleague of mine fishes, we don't do it often enough when it comes to other kinds of lived experiences. And some of it, of course, um, varies based on what staffers are willing to share about themselves, what they feel safe sharing in the newsroom. If people on your team have experience with the criminal justice system, with addiction in their families, with um, you know immigration experiences in their family, um, are they comfortable with their faith? Are they comfortable talking about that? Does your newsroom culture invite that, um, invite people to show up as their whole selves? Does it respect when they don't want to do that and want to keep things private? Obviously, it has to do with both newsroom culture and individual preference. But the question of how many journalists, do we have newsroom teams of journalists who reflect a variety of viewpoints on an issue, I think is a really important one. Um, and so we have one example here of, again, from Tangle, how when Isaac Saul was writing about abortion, he included this language. He said, a couple of years ago when I was building my team, we hired an intern from Tennessee who had unabashed pro-life views. Since I am somebody with a generally pro-choice perspective, she was the single most important person on my staff anytime we covered abortion. I sought out her opinions to challenge our coverage and look for blind spots. And I think that that, I think about that a lot because I think of how much courage it would take in a newsroom. If you don't have the kind of newsroom that has this stated goal, a lot of times it would take a ton of courage in a newsroom for someone to raise their hand and say, like, actually, I see this through a different lens than a lot of the other people covering this topic. Um, um, and I don't, uh, 
I don't think that what we're doing would, you're not using the language that people in my community or my family or my place of worship would use. Um, what you're actually saying, I, I feel misrepresented. I feel like it's insulting. So this this happens across a variety of issues. And I know there are a lot of people who um, feel marginalized in society and in newsrooms and don't feel like they would be rewarded for kind of raising a big flag. Um, we hear that from um, journalists of color who feel like there are pieces of their experience and identity that they just don't want to bring up regularly. And it certainly has come up in our interview with people who lean right politically that when we've heard from journalists that they feel like closet conservatives in their newsroom, like it just wouldn't benefit them to kind of be louder about that part of their identity. So that's something we think about a lot. Um, a couple of examples I want to share, and then we'll move over to talking, talking with John about um, his thoughts on all this with the work he's done. One thing that journalists can do to make content hearable is to really get on the record about what your goals are with covering a topic overall or with a specific piece of content. So sometimes that can look like um, on top of a story saying, here's what we're trying to do with this story. So a newsroom we've worked with a lot is WITF in Pennsylvania. And when they were doing a, a Q&A a couple years ago about critical race theory, um, they knew that just a, just a story with a critical race theory in the headline was likely to provoke really strong reactions. And so the first choice they made was to format the story as a Q&A so that it kind of stripped away some of the emotional language. It was like, you know, what is this? What do we know about what this is? How has it applied in the past? How is it used today? Trying to cut through some noise. But this is an editor's note that they put at the top of a story um, a lot of discussion, it says, is clouded in misinformation. We encourage you to read this piece as an explainer, as it is designed to set out the facts. So this one was not about including a lot of voices. They're doing that in other coverage. We're just identifying the facts. And then another example, um, and we actually want to show you a quick video clip from this one. Um, the Kansas Leadership Center, um, the journal is a civic issues magazine there. And they they host community conversations and they do they they have principles um, of civic leadership that are embedded throughout their approach. And when they were hosting a public conversation two years ago, Kansas had a statewide voice um, vote about abortion. And when they were hosting a conversation about that, they did a really good job of setting up the goals and mission behind the work um, and showing humility about how they um may or may not be getting it right and inviting feedback on that. So if this will play, we're gonna show you a quick video from Chris Green. Oh shoot, I don't hear it. Okay, well, we will just um, describe it. Sorry about that. We thought we had the audio working. Um, so Chris Green talks about how the work that he had done talking to people across the political spectrum before hosting this conversation, he talked about the need to how hard it was to find places to have a conversation like this, the trust he was putting in the community to show up in the right spirit, um, and their goal of, of, of hosting a conversation and sharing views that people would feel like represented the best version of really divergent political views. And he, they understood their audience enough, and I think it earned enough trust that they could do this when not all news organizations could. Um, I'm not sure that they would have suffered from the same perception that they were taking sides that a lot of news outlets would. But the um, the way he laid out, we'll stick a link in the chat, the way that he um, laid out the goals of the conversation, I think that the spirit of that is something journalists can really learn from. So I encourage you to watch just the first couple of minutes of this if you get a chance. So um, now we are going to stop sharing my screen and I'm so excited to welcome John here and ask him um, some questions. Uh, all of the things that we talked about today, we felt like John did a really um, great job in emulating in his coverage on, on guns. And so um, welcome, John. Thanks so much for being here with us today. We really appreciate your time. Um, the first question that I have for you is... Um, I mean, the reason that your work really came onto our radar at Trusting News is because you were really um, clear and specific about the approach you were taking with the reporting. And like Joy was just saying, you were really clear about the mission and goals and what you were trying to accomplish with this um, coverage that you were doing. So 
I'd love for you to just talk a little bit about like when in the project and the reporting process did you decide to take that approach? Um, how early on and then how useful was it for you um, for readers and also potential um, sources for you to get on the record about this? Yeah, thank you so much for having me and um, for the work that you guys are doing at Trusty News. Um, really happy to be here today and, and uh, share some thoughts on this. So this project I did through the O'Brien Fellowship uh, for Public Service Journalism at Marquette University. So I work at the Journal Sentinel and did this project through that. And, you know, when we started off, one of the challenges was an editor had an idea to do this. And um, it felt like a really a topic on firearms that was old, or at least but not old, but but covered a lot. And what what was I going to say new? And I, I had written a lot of coverage over 20 years about this. So um, so the question was, how could we find something new? And I can talk a little bit about how um, I sort of came upon um, some new new views and some new points of view on this by engaging with uh, with firearms owners. That was a big aspect of this. But so you ask about the reporter notebook. This was the basically as I got into this, I kept having conversations with people. I'm sort of one of those people who talks through things. And so I'm very verbal that way. So I'd have these conversations and I was at Marquette, but I'd come over to um, to the Journal Sentinel. And I would just sort of say to people like, what's, what's going on with the project? And I would sort of just talk about my experience and these sort of remarkable interviews and interactions and insights that I was having from those interviews. Um, and an editor, Jill Williams, uh, said, hey, why don't you write something like first person about that? That's really interesting. So it's just one of those things where somebody, and I was like, you know, that would be really great because I could take people through my process and also include a lot of material that I, I'm not going to be able to get into sort of more traditional formats. Awesome. Thank you. Um, you touched on the sourcing. So I just want to circle back on that one um, because uh, the style of reporting that you did was really open. Um, I think we talked about uh, complicating the narrative and and some word that you used in a phrase that I've heard you use before in writing about it was that you were trying to be open to contradictions in your reporting. Um, and so I'd love for you to share a little bit about what you meant by that and, and how you accomplished that in your reporting. Yeah, thanks for that question. So, I mean, as we got into this, we said, so like, what could I write that was new? What, one of the things that we brought uh, out was we're looking at our, our study area was Wisconsin and the subject was firearms deaths. And what we did as we looked into this is that we, we found numbers that may be familiar with, with people uh, watching and listening now is that um, suicides are the biggest category. So 71% of gun deaths in Wisconsin are suicides, 25% uh, are homicides, 2% uh, are police involved, 1% are so-called accidentals. Um, those numbers are important for the reporting because what that meant is that there was a different conversation among gun owners around the suicide question. And as I got into this, um, I was interested and, and surprised um, and, and really humbled by the fact that there was a whole bunch of stuff happening around this issue that I wasn't aware of. And the biggest thing um, was that there was a grassroots effort among gun shops in our state and others called the Gun Shop Project, where they were acting as a place uh, where people could come and bring firearms in times of mental distress, either in their family or on their own part. Um, no questions asked, no government involvement, which is which is a big factor uh, in the communities that I spoke to. And um, and it was really leaning in in a way that uh, was solutions that were maybe different than the solutions that were sort of being offered, you know, regularly. And and there was uh, there was also um, as I talked to people, and I talked to my editor Greg Borowski, who who's the editor on this project, is that. I kept having these remarkable conversations with people where they did contradict themselves. And I, I use the example of Kurt Green um, because Kurt Green is the coroner in Manitowoc, which is uh, between uh, Milwaukee and Green Bay, smaller uh, on Lake Michigan shipping uh, uh, community and, and industrial. So Kurt is, um, he's a strong second amendment uh, supporter. His daughter uh, hunts with an AR-15. Um, he is also a Democrat. And I said, well, Kurt, like, how do you exist? Because like, according to like social media or whatever, you, you gave the example earlier, like you don't exist. And he's like, I'm right here, you know, I'm, 
I'm here, and I, I, I don't, I don't uh, back down off of anything I'm saying. My dad was a proud uh, union guy, and that's the, my Democratic roots. And you know, I grew up around guns, and I keep guns for self-defense. And and his day job is he is going to deaths a lot. He also supports um, uh, red flag laws. So he has all these things that make him, um, according to these simplified um, uh, narratives that, that I think really flatten people, he's three-dimensional. And that's really what people are. And, and so we started with that and others. And what Greg said is, rather than kind of shoehorn these in as examples, let's let these breathe a little bit. And that's how this sort of way that we, we wrote these um, sort of, they're not really vignettes, but they're, you know, they're individual profiles of individuals, you know, that we met doing this work. Can I jump in for a minute? I just want to make sure I heard your statistics correctly. Did you say 75% of gun deaths in Wisconsin are suicide and 20% well, on of homicide? Yep. Uh, it, depending on the year, uh, the, the, over uh, 20 years, 71% are suicide, 25% are homicide. And um, But in some counties, what we found is that 80, 90, 100% of gun deaths our suicide. And so what we did is we looked at all gun deaths and we adjusted for population. And the big thing for us, and, and because so much about gun deaths in Wisconsin is about Milwaukee and importantly so, but when you adjusted for population and included suicides, Wisconsin wasn't number one. More rural places. So this is the narrative of, of gun deaths there. And I wondered as I wrote this, whether people would feel like this was an anti-gun story because we were adding in suicides. That's not the way it landed because we started from a position of um, let's understand why this is an important among not the gun community, because there is not a gun community, there are gun communities, uh, but why is it important there? And through, so I think through a position of curiosity and care, uh, that number came through. Um, but to your to your point, yes, that is nationally, it's more around 60% suicide. Um, but in individual states, depending on the issues, primarily what moves that number is the homicide number. But it is surprising to people. So it seems like that's a fundamental thing. The collective narrative that journalism tells about this topic is inaccurate, it seems like. If I'm surprised by that, and I don't know that, yep. and so much of it is based on as, as coverage of homicide, that, that I don't know about things like the gun shop project, that I don't know mm -hmm. and could not name stories that I've seen that talk about the Democrat whose daughter hunts with with um, um, an AR-15. I think that that, it just feels to me like they're, I guess I'm, I'm wondering if it feels to you like collective narratives are just inaccurate. It, it, it is, it, I, and I guess what I... It's funny, and it's not funny, I guess it's just humbling to know that I've worked in this space. I've been in Milwaukee like 20 years. I grew up here, was out in Colorado, uh, covered the military for a while and came back. And I've written a lot about, I covered the police department. Um, I cover, I, I kind of was the go-to person around guns. I've covered uh, gun shops, a lot of issues around this. But I had never really gotten into an among community in a way, really with a mindset of can I develop you know, cultural competency in this group in a higher level, in another way. Um, now, I had a couple things that helped me in that, in that having covered the military was helpful, having uh, been around the police and so forth, that was helpful. But, you know, it was, um, I think some of the things of, of the narratives that you see, I have, a, I have a, uh, somebody I've kept in touch with who I covered in the military, and he's a retired Army intelligence officer. And he said, John, the problem that you guys have in the media is that you guys um, overemphasize the unusual and you suppress the usual. And that creates an impression that's faulty of the world. So we don't write about suicides that often. And so for instance, we write about accidental or unintentionals a lot. And and rightly so, I'm not, I'm not like, because there are reasons why unintentional uh, deaths are really important, especially when the victim class is a you know a small child. And suicides, there's reasons that we don't write about that. Uh, but we have to understand that that way creates impressions that are you know difficult uh, for people to ascertain if they're just reading the news that they're not getting a really accurate picture of the world. And so, if people who see this issue through that through a, um, a gun ownership lens find media coverage to be fundamentally inaccurate, 
um, they might not be wrong. And that is without even mentioning the um, all the things that journalists get wrong because of a, just a lack of exposure and understanding, right? Like I have a kid who's um, very into this topic, a, a teenager, and he loves to send me examples of where just terminology about firearms are used incorrectly. Um, and it seems like it's probably just from a lack of exposure or understanding in the newsroom about um, just the language of the topic. Yeah, that's right. I mean, so I had a little bit of an advantage having covered the military. That's a big thing in military coverage too, is terminology. But when I came into this, one of the things as I got in, and again, people have asked me, how did you get into this community? How did you get people? And the way it was, there was a guy, Chuck Lovelace, who owned a gun store in a rural part of Wisconsin. Um, and he really got this whole gunshot project started. And I did the piece on him first. And you mentioned Solutions Journalism Network. This is this is us sort of turning around rather than doing a solutions piece sort of mid or later into the project. We opened up with a solution story, and that was about the gunshot project. And the way that that played is, I mean, our, my idea was like people are already bummed and depressed about gun deaths, and I'm going to just say it's three times worse than you know. Like, that's not great, you know. So can we talk? Can we can we lead with with solutions? And that's what we did. And that story, in effect, became a calling card for us to be able to come into other, you know, uh, you know, other communities and help us to be able to um, get access uh, into those communities. And when I got into those communities, some of the terminology that I've used often, people said what do you mean by that? Or that may come, that may feel like it's partisan. And I will give examples. Ooh, like what? Yes, just, please. Like, right, right. Like what? Well, like gun violence. Um, so here's the, and, I, and again, I'm not like throwing shade on people to say, hey, you know, you're all bad because you use this sort of thing. I've used it for like two decades. And the terms are like gun violence, safe storage, responsible gun owner, and so forth. Those are, um, those are really catchphrases, and some of them have been, you know, used by, uh, you know, sort of one side or the other. And I say there's more than two sides, but but they've been used by groups uh, that that sort of have a position on these uh, on these on this issue. The problem is, and it's a big one in my view as journalists. If if people do not universally understand what we're saying, we've got a problem. Like if if we use a phrase, and that that's what. That's what I would say to some some of the interviews is say, well, I would say something about gun violence. And they say, well, what do you mean by that? And that's then then I started asking, I'm not sure what I mean by that. Because okay, so if somebody's shot or killed with a with a firearm or injured, you know, like that's definitely gun violence. Um, if somebody's shot at and not hit, yeah, that's probably gun violence. Um, is a suicide gun violence? Yep, yep. So probably. But what about just touching a weapon? What about pointing a weapon? What about the existence of a firearm could in and of itself be violent? And so I guess I was taught a while ago, and I kind of went back to this from uh, from an editor, George Stanley, uh, who, who's this, this project was his, his idea. Um, if it's not clear what you mean, use more words. You know, so 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 I don't use the phrase gun violence in this um, for that reason. And, and, you know, also things like safe storage, and I'm working on something right now, that means a lot of different things to different people. So I tried to use different things, or to the example that you use, use a different phrase that's new to people and might catch people so they wouldn't breeze right over it. Um, so, it, and it's not, I think sometimes people say, well, you know, you're sugarcoating uh, the issue, but it's not that uh, because certainly I think if you read the series, it's clear the death and injury that has happened because of the misuse of firearms over time. It's just that the phrase is not understood. And the use of the phrase is like a stop sign for some people. They're not going to read because they perceive that this piece is going to have you know, an agenda. Yeah, that was exactly what um, we've heard from other newsroom partners too. So I'm so glad that you touched on it, John, that um, these small things that journalists do, like mislabeling firearms, like using these generalized terms just can instantly turn people off, um, which is obviously not our our goal as journalists. Um, one thing, I thanks for touching so much on the sourcing and, and kind of how that process worked on and how you work to um, kind of get into that community. I'm curious, um, because some of the stories that you have throughout um, your coverage and some of these vignettes, you did lots of different vignettes of people and kind of telling their stories. Um, 
I, I obviously the solution story helped you kind of get into the community and get a foot in there, but how did you um, like approach these conversations? How did you build trust with these sources that you would take care of their stories, especially when there's like such a history of obviously journalists not taking care with coverage like this and, and um, making, yeah, skewing, pe making people feel like their um, perspectives aren't heard. Um, and some of these stories are just are really vulnerable and heart wrenching stories. So I'm curious um, um, how you took care of that and, and how you took care of sources and, and how you kind of built that rapport with them. That's yeah, a really good question, Molly. Um, so one of the questions that I would get sometimes, you know, right off the bat uh, in these interviews is, do you own a gun? So, and this isn't the first time that I've had that question at the beginning of an interview. And I don't know, it just, in this process, um, maybe because I was, you know, you know, invited in after I talked to Chuck and did that piece uh, to kind of think about it differently. It didn't quite, it, in the past, it had landed a lot more defensively than it did this time. And so I'll tell you how I kind of answered it. Uh, well, it was, it was no. I mean, since that time, I've now technically a gun owner. I say to the, the people I'm still in touch with from the project, I said barely, you know, like I inherited my dad's, he, my dad passed away in January and inherited his 22 heirloom rifle. So I have that now. Um, I don't know if you, uh, Joy, your son might say I don't qualify, but I'm just like right at, right at the edge. But, but I just got curious at that point rather than getting offended. And I tried to keep in that posture of curiosity that there might be, um, this question might be coming from a, a, of a place of distrust, or even when you think of in terms of the therapeutic world, sometimes questions come in that are reflecting a past hurt. And what you're seeing is the top level, but you don't know the history. And there, and it's hard, especially when you come in for somebody who maybe has been interviewed before, and uh, maybe they felt that they were betrayed, or that there was something um, that was... Um, Maybe they haven't been interviewed, but they feel like they have in the coverage that they've they've read because they have not seen themselves uh, in the coverage. And um, so I took it slow in these interviews. Um, I did not take offense at the beginning. And I, what, what I wanted to do was lean in. And not everybody asked me that question, but when it came up, I would lean in to a... Um, what I might call an asymmetrical question. So what I mean by that is sometimes you come into these and say, okay, like I want to know how do you stand on this really issue? You know, like you're a gun owner. What do you say about background checks? Um, you know, 80% or 97% agree on this and these common sense approaches. Okay, so two problems with that. One is that you're sort of hitting people over the head with polls, which, you know, can be, be like wrong or just not nuanced, depending on how they're uh, implemented. And using the phrase common sense suggests that you're, you know, you're kind of an idiot if you don't believe this. Like, I'll just be frank about this. It has a sort of shaming that comes into this. And I've done that. Like, I've gone to places and said, okay, like, I'm talking to gun owners now or in other issues. You know, I'm talking to hunters now or I'm talking to, you know, uh, police officers now. I'm talking to different groups. What do you all think about this? What I did on this was pause, pull back and say, let's talk about your story. What is your story around firearms? Because everybody has a story. And particularly with this issue, it's something that people are very passionate about. And so I took, I took that as a starting point and say, if there is interest in this and, and um, there is, and there's passion in this and people care about this very, very much, um, there's a human side that they just want to talk about what they care about. So that's where I started with a lot of people. And we've got around to those other issues later, um, but not leading in with that. And the story became then it became this powerful narrative that led to the vignette approach that led to a, you know, to a different approach. And I could start to see what appear to be contradictions, but they're not. They're just like where people live. Yeah. yeah one of the things you sent me, um, John, and then we'll turn to questions. I see one from Kurt we'll get to in just a minute. Um, one of the things you sent me that really stuck with me is I think you were interviewed on a podcast from like a pro second amendment podcast. And the topic was like mental health and safety. Mm -hmm. 
And what this person said as he was introducing the podcast and then introducing you was, don't we want to take control of this ourselves as gun owners? Like we don't want to cede this conversation at, at to people who do not have respect for our right to own guns in the first place. And and I was embarrassed by how surprising that was to me because I'm so used to um, inaccurate narratives that are like, well, people on this side want to be careful with guns and people on this side want, must must not care as much about about the safety issues. And I just think the fact that you earned enough trust with sources to be somebody that they wanted to invite on their podcast and include as part of the conversation was really impressive. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that's Cam Edwards. And, um, and that was a big part of what we wanted to do is we wanted to get this work in front of different audiences. And one of the things that, that uh, when I was on Cam's podcast, one of the comments from people is um, he, he, the uh, gentleman said, you know, I really wish uh, that I, I applaud John's work and I really wish this kind of work appeared in the mainstream media. And Cam's like, well, John is the mainstream media, just to be clear. But what that did, what the project did is disrupt a narrative among some 2A communities. It's known as 2A about communities us. sometimes. About us, right. And so that that story that I wrote, which then got picked up and reprinted in USA Today is having a disrupting effect even now among 2A communities because there's certain people that I spoke to who are disruptors within the 2A community because they're talking about mental health and suicide. Cam's one of them, Mike Sedini's another one. Um, they're using that. Like they're saying, hey, your narrative in the 2A community that we're never going to have our story told is not true. Here it's being told. So that's mixing up stuff over there. Things are mixing up over here back and forth. And that's that to me is kind of where, you know, where where we see this. And to your point about disrupting, you know, the, the idea that we need to be part of the conversation, I found great care and concern in all the categories of these gun deaths, uh, suicide, homicide, uh, police involved and, and unintentional, all were all really uh, concerning to people. The solutions might have been different and they might have looked different, but there was concern um, and, and there was a desire to say, hey, rather than just say like nothing uh, can happen at all, let's lean into this. And that's something I heard a lot as I talked to people in this space. Well, let me bring in a couple of um, questions from participants today. Kurt says, I feel like it's a common dynamic for reporters or program staff to write a piece with calm, dispassionate language. And then for editors or comms folks or people whose job maybe is the metrics, I'm inserting that myself, who want to make headlines and other language grabby and dramatic. Do you have any advice um, for navigating newsroom dynamics about sort of um, taking a more measured approach and then as it gets packaged and shared with the world, feeling like maybe that careful tone was undermined. Mm -hmm. No, that's a really good point. I mean, and I, you know, I don't know how, how clicky and viral nuance is, you know, I'll, I'll just be like clear about that. Um, so, and I, you know, the numbers in the end, I don't know. Um, they weren't, uh, you know, off the charts, like some, like some stuff uh, that I've done on other issues and but I think you have to fight for the nuance and you have to fight for this to make it clear that we're doing something different. I mean, it helped that Greg was the editor uh, on the project because he's the executive editor of the paper. Uh, and he became that in the project. This is what a part of the story of the project is like a lot happened. And one was that George left and Greg moved from one position up to it. So, but, but, that doesn't mean that everything just happens. There was some arguments to say, hey, can, but you could say things that grab people that are not inflammatory, you know, like, you know, that, that just catch people's interest because especially if you're talking about something that is contrary to the narrative, that in itself can be clicky. Because it's surprising, can surprise right? People. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. it's surprising, right? So that hits one of the categories, and how you can do that without being sort of uh, shaming or, um, you know, kind of I I don't know, just you know, still caring for your people that you're writing about, I think is a real gift. And I don't, I mean, we have people who do amazing work on headlines and social media and stuff like that, but we had to have kind of a, a I think, buy-in, uh, you know, early on. And I'll say one of the reactions that, um, and I did hear some reactions afterwards, 
one of them from a source was he said, John, your um, your piece has confused everybody at the gun club uh, because everybody keeps looking for what's the agenda, what's the surprise with and, and it's not there. And um, and so that was uh, that was really I get a lot of uh, positive responses and I, I just sort of hold that one up too to say uh, this is a this is a conversation starter and changer, hopefully. We have another question. Um, Aaron asks, when crafting questions for an interview around a sensitive topic like this, how do you ensure that you remain as neutral as possible while also ensuring that facts are adequately represented? So mm -hmm. like, how do, what is the, what, what role does the framing of the questions play and how are you careful with your own language and approach? Yeah, no, I think that's really good. And also the, um, you know, the, the, uh, how you might introduce st statistics you know, into this. Um, so one of the things that I would assume is, and you, you teed this up at the beginning, um, not an assumption that I have this all figured out. Uh, like the, the, the fact that I've been doing this for a while can actually be a liability. So let me stipulate to that first as I go into this to humbly say, okay, I might not have this all figured out even though I've written all these stories about it. Could there be something new? Absolutely, and there is. And this, this project has had probably more... I mean, every project and every piece of work has an effect, but I would say at this stage, if, if I'm given it, uh, this project has had more of a change in my lens of how I'm seeing things broadly, especially at the time that we find ourselves. So coming into it with that and crafting questions with that assumption to say, you know, um, hey, I might not have this right or this sort of thing, they could be softer questions. They presume that knowing that, you know, you do know your information at the background and you try upon follow-up questions to stay in that posture of curiosity. And also when you bring a statistic, um, and this is comes sometimes like, it goes something like this. Well, you know, a gun that is kept in your house is more likely to be used against you than in a home defense. Like the, we see this a lot and, and it gets quoted a lot and it's just sort of thrown in stories. Um, you know, that's that's problematic on a couple levels. And as I talk to gun owners, I would bring up that information, but not in that sort of weaponized, it feels a little like shaming or hitting you over the head with it, which is something like, hey, big dummy, why do you have a gun, right? That's kind of, to me, what I hear under that question, which I never really heard until somebody sort of said it back to me. It's like, and that person said, I understand that this is a rare event. The likelihood of this is rare. Um, it depends on your... Um, your risk profile, um, which may change depending on where you live, if you have a domestic violence, you know, so there's different, and I'm not arguing one way or another, but it's not uniform. And to spread it out over a state or the country, there's problems with that. But getting more nuanced about it, but being able to bring up important statistics like that and say, what do you make of this? Like you've heard this maybe, what do you make of that, you know, low probability, high risk event? That's how, that's how gun owners think about this is like low probability, but like there's a big risk that comes with it. So, so adopting that language um, and you can find that language pretty easily when you look around, you know, websites and things like that. Humility, again, humility and curiosity. Um, one more question we have um, actually has to, I'll take a stab at answering it first and then John, feel free to chime in. Somebody asked um, whether using AI is helpful in making, in kind of uh, checking out your language and whether it can make, um, bring some neutrality to the language, create less polarizing language. And I will just say that that's something we have experimented with at Trusty News. Actually, I used a gun story once when I was testing it, asking a chat GBT or something, a question like, how would this story feel to gun owners or to people who see, who see this issue from a range of perspectives? And actually some of the responses it brought back were useful. Um, if you do have a question about something like how would these terms be perceived or what are different ways this issue is described by people across the political spectrum or across a range of views on this, I have I've found that to be useful. I think it's something the industry needs to keep um, experimenting with for sure. John, I don't know if you have done any of that or have any thoughts on that. Well, I haven't done it with questions. Um, I, I did have a reservation about AI that just came up because I looked, I was just working with some numbers on accidentals or in, in, unintended uh, shootings and um, especially with kids. And this is a, a category that gets um, 
uh, understandably and, and justifiably so a lot of uh, uh, attention. I, 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 AI came back and I said, how many you know accidental gun deaths are there in the United States every year? And it said in 2021, uh, there were 2,200 and something. That's way off. You know, like it, it's actually 500 or 450 a year. And what they were doing is they were pulling from a study, looking at a range of years and tagging it to one year year so anyway just side note that's not about questions but that gave me some reservations to go uh deeper into one of the limitations of ai um the other thing that i think that that could be helpful what i did is i would go and check language out with some trusted sources and i still do that now so these are gun owners and that started with like that when i was talking about the uh uh the um uh, retired army officer, uh, intelligence officer, and I've got some other sources that I've known through the years and and and, and friends. Um, and we did that when we created a poll. So we did the largest, most in-depth poll of gun owners in Wisconsin. And I ran all that language by my gun sources to say, hey, where are we wrong here? Where is this going to turn people off? Where is this going to, you know, um, and, and, you know, it wasn't like they got to write the poll, uh, well, I mean, they really helped in us writing a you know, valid poll. We didn't take every single um, suggestion, but it really helped uh, that. So, But I'm open to the idea. I guess right now I, I, I would be more comfortable going to my trusted sources if you have that relationship with them, right? That That's a special relationship that you can go to somebody and say, you know, check me out on this. Well, and that just goes back to the necessary step in newsrooms of acknowledging what you might be missing because the whole unspoken premise here is that in newsrooms you do not I and mean, it's sort of spoken but in newsrooms we we do not have a lot of colleagues who could there are plenty of issues where we would turn to other people in the newsroom and say hey help yep. ground me in this um you're jewish can you check this language for me you have kids in schools can you check this language for me and we we lose we don't have that you know we have uh, gaps in our knowledge in newsrooms based on our own um, the makeup of the staff and the lived experiences of the staff. So we, we at Trusty News ask a lot of questions about things like how many people covering abortion come from a perspective of deep empathy or understanding of um, a pro-life perspective, you know, regardless of how they how they vote or what their own experiences themselves. So I think that's just a question we have to keep asking. It's a really good point. And we don't have a lot of gun owners, um, though I'm getting questions from people kind of quietly on the side, some in the newsroom, some not, who tend to, to skew more progressive should I buy a gun? Um, which I'm always like, hey, I'm not saying yes or no, but if you do, here's what you should do. Um, and But yeah, we don't have a lot of gun owners. We don't have a lot of people who identify as uh, whatever, you know, kind of some of these phrases, you know, but like more conservative Christian or fundamentalist, you know, Christian. Um, we might not have, I mean, I, I would also push back just a little bit on the comment that the Tangle editor had that somebody is an unabashed like pro-life, I'd like, why do you need to say unabashed? Just say like, that sounds like there's something, I don't know, that that caught my attention just to say like, that's just another view. And so why unabashed? But um, but yeah, that's always a challenge. And I'm learning too, because we have a lot of people who come in with different life experiences that are different from me and I'm checking and we should be checking ourselves all the time. I think we tend to have less of the conservative or what might be viewed in that spectrum, you know, in, you know, in our newsroom, it's not across the board, and there's certainly exceptions to that. But that's been my, my experience. Awesome, thank you, John, so much. I feel like we could keep asking you questions for hours, but we are out of time, so I'm going to wrap up to respect everyone's time. But thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I will just stick in the chat a link to a column that John recently wrote that we published on Trusting News that gets at even more kind of the strategies and tactics that John uh, would recommend for reporting. So. Check that out if you want to um, learn more and has this contact information there as well. Um, real quick, uh, we just have another one of these trainings coming up in two weeks on kind of last minute tips on what to do on election day. So we hope to see you there. Um, that is Thursday, October 17th at the same time. So if you're registered for this one, you're registered for that one as well. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, John. All right.